Patrick. Hello, I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland woodworker. Let's see what we have in store for you today. This time on the Highland Woodworker, a moment with a master, chairmaker Brian Boggs gives us a rare peek inside of his Asheville workshop. You won't believe his cutting edge work. The plane maker, Ron Brees, explains how previous careers pushed the Brees plane to perfection. There's something about Cherry, why Bert the Wood Expert puts it on the top of his list. What you need to know about pegs, a quick tip from Popular Woodworking Magazine's editor, Matthew Teague. It's a grind. We're taking a closer look at must-have shaping gear inside the toolbox. Careful considerations, questions you need to answer before finishing your next masterpiece. All of this and more, this time on The Highland Woodworker. The Highland Woodworker is brought to you by Highland Woodworking. Find tools delivered to your door since 1978. This portion of the Highland Woodworker is presented by Forest Manufacturing Saw Blades for smooth, quiet, precise cuts, guaranteed. And by Peach State Lumber Products, your source for high-grade hardwoods. I'm at Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia. This is like Disneyland for a woodworker. They've got all the tools and classes and a great staff to help you with your next project. Every fine woodworking shop should have a good smooth plane. Ron Brees is a fine woodworker who went against the grain to make his very own piece of highly functional art. Hold on, Charles. Why are you skewing that plane? Well, the planes I have, I've tuned them up and everything, and then people say, hey, when you plane, you've got to turn it sideways so that it'll lift. But Chuck, I've gone through a lot of trouble to make this plane at 55 degrees so it'll handle tough grain like curly cherry with a quarter sawn edge with curl faces coming through it. The best way to plane this is with the full pitch of the 55 degrees running straight down the board. Well, let's see what it'll do. Ho ho! That is beautiful. Yeah. Now, is that what it's all about? That's pretty impressive, Chuck, but the real result is right here. That's why you have a plane, and a plane like this. Sometimes people ask me how I got into plane making, and sometimes I tell them I think plane making sort of chose me. I was a full-time furniture maker. As I started refining my work more and more, I found myself migrating more and more to hand tools, specifically hand planes and a good bit of my work. In the business that I'm in, you're constantly dealing with a compromise between being an artist and manufacturing and you've got to meld the two things. I had a background in metalworking, and I certainly had a background in woodworking, and this was an opportunity to sort of combine both elements into something that I thought might be an enjoyable hobby. When I was a furniture maker, I made objects that had function, but this was an opportunity to actually make something with great aesthetic value that had a high level of function that you could actually build something else with before I even discovered there was a higher refinement of work was to avoid so much sanding. Presently, I make a line of infill planes. In the past couple of years, I've sort of progressed into a line of precision planes, many made out of stainless steel. Woodworkers are wanting more corrosion resistant materials for their tools. Typically, the customers for my planes break down into about 15 to 20 percent collectors. Another 30% would be studio furniture makers, people that are in the shop every day. Probably the majority or 50% are serious hobbyists that have a limited amount of time to spend in their shop and want that amount of time to be as pleasurable as possible while they're there. So this is an infill plane. Yes, Charles, if you look at it, you'll see that we have a Macassar Ebony infill that's sitting precisely in this plane body, which is made out of brass and steel. And you can see it's basically in the plane body, zero clearance. In other words, it's perfectly tight. 
and that is what's considered an infill plane as compared to a wooden body plane where the whole structure would be made from wood. So it's the same back here? It's the very same oh, back here. Wow. So do you have to use a plane to plane this wood to make it fit? I do. Uh, the tolerances that we work in are so close when we start trying to fit a piece of wood like this into a very precise plane body that the only way you can really get that precise, almost suction type fit is do the final refi refinement with a hand plane. That's wonderful. Okay, and then you make another type. Yes, these are a couple of examples of my precision stainless line of planes. These planes are made to very tight tolerances. The bedding, the way the iron sits into the plane is very critical. This plane is so solid that when you use it, the only thing that moves here is it down the board and the shaving through the mound. Amazing. Well, Ron, this is a, a beautiful old Stanley plane. Can you tell me something about it? Charles, this is a pre-World War II number four Stanley plane. Uh, it's a very nice tool and it performs well when it's very sharp. The difference between this plane and one of these planes, well, there's actually a couple of things. The bedding plate, or which is called a frog in these planes, is actually bolted to the sole of the plane. Whereas the bedding plate in my tool is integral of the side, which creates a very rigid torsion box type construction. To get this tool to perform well on figured woods, you need to adjust the frog forward in order to close up the mouth so you hold the wood fibers very tightly. And when you do that, it some, the, moving the frog forward leaves the back of the iron somewhat unsupported. I see. Now when this iron in this tool has a very tack sharp edge, it will perform very well. But as it starts losing that edge, the fact that it's not supported so well on the back means its performance is going to degrade quicker. In my planes, the iron is supported all the way down to the point to where the bevel on the iron begins and the mouth stays a constant four thousandths mouth. This puts the wood in a very vulnerable position to be sheared, and even as this plane starts losing a little bit of that tack edge, it still performs better for a longer period of time. You know, one other thing, Ron, there is an adjustment lever here. I don't see one on yours. Chuck, the lever caps on these planes are so rigid and so strong and when they're tuned perfectly to the back of the iron, uh, using a mechanical adjuster in these tools is more of a problem than not. You would have to loosen the lever cap screw in every instance to, to use a threaded adjuster. If you didn't, you'd stretch the threads. Well, when you do that, you almost always lose your lateral adjustment. So you might find yourself adjusting them laterally with a hammer anyway. Well, I have found, and my customers have found, that they can just set it, tighten the screw one time, make the adjustments with the hammer quicker and more accurately than they can with a mechanical adjuster. Well, you've sold me. Now I just have to sell my wife on the idea. Thank you so much, Ron. This was a treat. I can't wait to get mine. I enjoyed having you, Chuck. Come back to see me anytime. I'm in the wood room at Highland Woodworking, and I'm considering this cherry for my next project. Let's go talk to Bert, the wood expert at Peach State Lumber. He'll tell me all I need to know about using this wonderful American hardwood for my next project. Hey, Bert. How are you doing there? Oh, I'm doing great. It's wonderful to be back here at Peach State Lumber. It's always great to have you. Oh, listen, I'm interested in some cherry. All right. Uh, you know, I've built lots of projects out of cherry, some arts and crafts projects and some mission type. But you know, there's a lot that I don't know about it. Will you kind of introduce me to the world of cherry lumber? You've come to the right place. Oh, cherry first is a domestic hardwood. It's a North American tree. Uh, it comes primarily from the East Coast. Some of the best cherry in the world comes out of West Virginia and Pennsylvania. They're really known for their cherry. The minerals in the ground, the weather, produce the best color, the largest size blogs. It's, it's really the ideal location. The price is very reasonable for uh, a hardwood, and uh, it, it works extremely well, and it seems to be gaining a little bit more in popularity. Selecting cherry out in the rough, you want to kind of look past all the dirt, the grading marks. All that will surface out. 
What you do want to look for, though, you see uh, how it's kind of yellow and white in this board? Sure. That is sapwood. That will not surface out. And then, of course, any defects or knots. One thing that is interesting about cherry, little knots like contained right there, if mm -hmm. a knot is less than an eighth of an inch in diameter, it's not really considered a defect as far as lumber grading standards go, but it could be a defect in your project. Yeah, there's a project I did about 15 years ago that's a, a chair and it kind of sits in a window and it started out that light kind of pink color and then now it's just a, a real deep reddish brown. Uh, and what causes that? Of oh, sunlight, oxidation of the wood, obviously, the UV rays, it's uh, similar to uh, almost receiving a suntan, I would <laughs> kind of put it in <laughs> terms. But yes, the, the sunlight and, and also the air a lot of times will cause it in species. But in the cherry, it's primarily sunlight. You can see clearly where the band was on this cherry, where the sunlight did not get to it, uh, which is fine. As soon as it surface, that'll come right out and we'll end up with some really nice looking lumber here. Bert, the first project I did with cherry, uh, I found these little uh, dots and, and uh, pockets and things and I kept trying to get rid of them. Uh, was that a, a dumb thing to do? What, what, what causes this? And Those are actually, in lumber terms, called uh, gum pockets or pitch pockets. And that's one of the ways to tell you you have something made out of real cherry. It's a characteristic of cherry hardwood, North American cherry hardwood. It is, uh, there's really three things that can cause that. The first would be ice or wind damage when the tree's growing. Uh, beetles cause it, and there's also a little fly, believe it or not, called the leaf miner fly that will lay its larvae in the bark of a cherry tree, and it will leave little uh, pitch pockets or gum pockets behind as the tree tries to heal itself and grow. Uh, if they have more of those, is it more prized sometimes? Sometimes we have whole units or, or whole bundles of hardwood set aside that are just covered in gum and pitch pockets. And we actually sell it as gummy cherry. And it's, it's very popular for cabinets and furniture. And I noticed back here we have a piece of cherry that uh, seems the grain's going this way and then there's some uh, figure or something going that way. What, what is that? This is really a, a, a special board here. This, this is called a, a curly. Uh, figure in, in a cherry board. You can get curly in quite a few species of hardwood lumber. Cherry's also one of them. Uh, these boards are, are highly prized. They're uh, uh, quite a bit uncommon to come by. Suppose you don't need a perfect long piece of cherry for your project so it has no defects. How about if you need some shorter pieces, something that might fit my budget? Absolutely. We carry a two common grade cherry. It is a lower grade than the FAS. You can expect some defects, some narrower widths in, in too common. You have some, some good solid knots, some open knots, a few worm holes, and it also contains more wane, as you can see down at the end of that board. It's becoming more and more popular, plus it saves a lot of money. So it's, it's something you might want to ask for before you buy a cherry for your next project. Thank you so much, Bert. Thanks for coming. I learned so much about cherry, about common boards, about FAS, and about curly cherry. I think I'm ready for my project now. I sure hope so. We'll <laughs> see you next time. All right, thanks for coming. Coming up on the Highland Woodworker, Matthew T gives us a quick tip on putting pegs in legs, plus a moment with a master, Brian Boggs, Find out how this book started a new chapter in this fine chairmaker's life. Those stories and much more, you're watching The Highland Woodworker. Skill building workshops, aisles of incredible tools, and the chance to talk shop with top woodworkers. It's all yours at Woodworking in America, the country's premier woodworking events. This year you can join us in Cincinnati or Pasadena for one of these unforgettable shows. Each features workshops with experts like Roy Underhill, Frank Klaus, David Marks, and dozens of other top woodworkers. Plus, you'll find a marketplace where more than 50 exhibitors offer hands-on exposure to the latest tools. Reserve your spot today at woodworkinginamerica.com. If you can't make it to Atlanta, then you can always shop us on the web 
at www.highlandwoodworking.com. This portion of the Highland Woodworker is presented by Popular Woodworking Magazine, JDS, leaders in air filtration, dust collection, and woodworking machinery, and by Gorilla Glue for the toughest jobs on planet Earth. Highland Woodworkers are found all over the world. Email a picture of you and your woodworking project along with your name and where you live to picture at thehighlandwoodworker.com. The Fordham die grinder is a wonderful tool to have in your shop. Everybody needs a die grinder. It may be one of the smaller ones. Uh, they're wonderful for even sanding or for uh, sculpting or for digging out a screw. Or There's just so many things you can do with it. This is kind of at the top end of Fordham products for woodworking. This is their one-third horsepower TX H for heavy duty series. This one is definitely the big boy. It's got the, the longer sheath. It's got a heavier duty motor. And it'll take the quarter inch collet that will allow you to put the big burrs on it like you see here. This is a, an extra coarse burr. Let me take you to my shop right now and I'll show you just how I use the Fordham TX series. I use the big one quarter inch shank carbide burrs. They last forever and they come in grits. Well, not southern grits, of course, but they come in grits from fine to extra coarse. You can go with or against the grain effectively. They come in a bunch of different shapes, like the sphere, which I use to carve a radius into a corner, and cylinders that can be used to carve sweeping curves and the bull nose, which is my favorite because it can do both. Burrs come in other shapes to help you carve the shape you want, and that makes it easy. Now the foot pedal comes with it, and if you're seated while you sculpt, let's say you're doing waterfowl, then it would be the perfect thing. But if you're moving around, I really like the bench top speed control. Whatever your die grinder needs are, then there is a Fordham product just right for your shop. We're going to Nashville, Tennessee and get a quick tip from Matthew Teague. He's Popular Woodworking's editor. Matthew, how are you doing today? Doing fine. How are you, Chuck? Great. What are you going to teach us today? Well, today we're going to talk about pegged mortise and tenon joinery. This is a very traditional technique. It's been used for ages as a way to reinforce these joints. Matthew, is that for strength or decoration? It's a good question, and it's actually both. Um, any mortise and tenon joint that you reinforce by driving a peg through both the, the mortise and the tenon piece is going to definitely add strength to it. But if you're paying attention to what you're doing, it's also a really easy way to have a, a nice decorative touch to whatever you're making. First thing you want to do is start with mortise and tenon joints that are really well fitted. You're looking for a joint that goes together with just a little hand pressure. If you have to reach for a mallet, chances are you're pressing your luck, and when you give it a few taps, there's always a risk that you'll split the leg out. But once you get something that fits well, just add a little glue, get it in the clamps, and then we'll come back and put the pegs in place. At the table saw, set the blade at whatever width you want your pegs to be. In this case, they're about a quarter of an inch. You make your life a lot easier if you make pegs that match the width of one of your chisels or are just a hair wider. Set the blade height just under a quarter inch thick so that you don't cut the pegging stock free because that can cause it to kick back towards you as you're cutting. By making two passes on each corner, you should be able to get four lengths of pegging stock from one board. Once it comes off the blade, simply fold the square stock back and forth to break the long lengths free, then cut them to the desired length. So once you get glue on the joints and you get it in the clamps, you can go ahead and put your pegs in. Uh, start by laying out the location of the pegs, which is what we've just done. After that, you're going to want to find a drill bit that's about a 32nd of an inch 
smaller than the peg stock you're using. I like to take an awl and start these holes so that the bit doesn't wander on me. So once you've got the holes drilled, you're just gonna take a chisel, use the same chisel you used at the table saw, square up the top 3 8 inch of the hole. Before you drive the pegs in place, you just wanna knock the corners off the bottom half of your peg, because only the top 3 8 inch, remember, is square. So once you're happy with the pegs, you're just gonna put a few drops of glue on the peg itself, and a little bit in the hole, set it in place. And I like to tap them in with a metal hammer. Uh, if you'll listen as you hammer, when it bottoms out in the hole, the pitch of the tap is gonna change just a little bit. You want to stop as soon as that changes, otherwise it's going to put pressure somewhere you don't want it. I'm going to leave them about a sixteenth long at this point. Then you're going to grab a chisel and just come in from the four corners. You don't want to go all the way across in one motion or it'll risk tearing it out. But if you can work in from the four corners and just kind of shave that away. what it should look like. And then when you sand it, the definition around it will get even a little stronger. So this is a pretty straightforward technique for a very traditional type of joinery used in woodworking all the time. As we were saying earlier though, there are a lot of decorative things you can do with this same technique. Here's just a few we've tried around this shop. So I'm Matthew Teague and this is Popular Woodworking's Quick Tip. Still ahead on the Highland Woodworker. Our Moment with the Master series takes us to beautiful Asheville, North Carolina, as master chairmaker Brian Boggs opens up his life and workshop to the Highland Woodworker. Also, the big finish, what you need to think about before applying finish to your next project. You're watching the Highland Woodworker. Behind that garage door, lies a kingdom, a place where all that's wrong and broken can be fixed. Armed with Gorilla Glue, imagination, and some elbow grease, there's nothing that can't be built, created, or repaired. Your kingdom awaits. Gorilla, for the toughest jobs on planet Earth. Visit GorillaGlue.com. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for over 30 years. They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year-round, ranging from how to hand cut dovetails and mortises, to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair, or a bookcase, or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, go to highlandwoodworking.com. Moment with a Master is presented by Forest Manufacturing. Saw blades for smooth, quiet, precise cuts, guaranteed. I received a lot of my inspiration from books and magazines. Brian Boggs received his first inspiration from James Krenov's The Fine Art of Cabinet Making. But find out how another book really inspired the work that Brian Boggs does today in our Moment with a Master. Asheville, North Carolina is a charming city nestled comfortably in the Blue Ridge Mountains with a French broad river flowing through its beautiful landscapes. It was established in the late 1700s as a pioneering town. Today, Asheville has it all, from barbecue to big brew. A laid back atmosphere where you'll find art studios and galleries around every corner. Downtown, their Wall Street isn't known as a financial district, but it does offer its fair share of gold, pearls, and priceless pancakes. Asheville's main attraction is America's largest home, the Biltmore Estate. Every year, thousands flock from all across the globe to take in the wonders and beauty of this national treasure. But just outside the gates 
In the long shadows of the huge house on a hill sits another treasure, a birthplace to some of the world's finest chairs. The man behind these masterpieces is a self-taught chairmaker whose brilliance as a woodworking engineer and artist make him a pioneer in the field of seating form and function. Let's spend a moment with a master, Brian Fox. Really early, I can remember a moment in the second grade when my uh, second grade teacher pointed out that I had some artistic tendencies and might ought to have some art lessons. And that's when my mother started taking me to get art lessons. And so I was painting and looking back on those paintings, I, I recently noticed there's a lot of trees I was painting. It's just, and I, I basically grew up in the woods. I spent all my time in the woods. and just had a real affinity for trees. But it didn't, it just, I didn't think about it. It was just something I would be in a tree or under a tree or playing in the trees in a tree house or painting trees. I mean, it was all about trees and I just never, never thought about it. That was just my life. And uh, thought I was just gonna be a painter, you know, drawing and painting as a professional artist. When Brian was 19, a visit to the public library changed the course of his life. Well, my eye caught James Krenov's book, The Fine Art of Cabinet Making. And f for me, that just seemed like a comic oxymoron. I mean, how could you, it's cabinet making, it's not fine art. So I, I pulled it just to kind of thumb through it. I thought, wow, this is pretty interesting. Had never had any experience woodwork, or even considered woodworking. Never had shop class in high school. I mean, I was sucked in. and. The reason that I didn't just go out and buy a bunch of equipment and set up shop right then and there is I didn't have any money. So I, I dreamed about it for a little while. Eventually ran across a book in my dad's house called Make a Chair from a Tree by John Alexander. And that one was refreshing for a couple of reasons. One, I loved the picture on the cover and that was my first chair eventually. But the simplicity of it, I love the physicality of it, you know, just ripping trees apart and carving each part to shape. And the fact that I could set up my first shop for $50, that was rather attractive. So I jumped into chairs, you know, all the way. This is a place where I just like to cut it, not fuss too much, because I like it to look fresh, not too labored over. Every woodworker needs to have the tools of their trade on hand. But Brian was finding that the tools in his shop could use some improving. So he took a hands-on approach. And I was trying to take an old Kun spoke shave, which I bought for new for $12, and trying to get a Krenov quality plain result from it. And I replaced everything but the initial casting and finally gave up and made one from scratch. And that started into a whole thing that led up to designing for Lee Nielsen more recently. This is the first tool I ever made. Uh, this is a tobacco knife I built when I was about 19. Uh, I learned how to cut tobacco when I was 13 years old. It was my first job ever. Yeah. And I cut tobacco every season until I was 23. But this, uh, it was about time to get a knife. I did not like the ones that were made because they just had straight handles and the blade, I didn't like the shape of the blade and it hurt. I, I wanted a lightweight springy handle because when you cut tobacco, you grab the plant like this, and then you spear it up. Well, when you hit that spear, the knife goes like this, and it pulls on a little muscle here. Well, you, if you're cutting 1,006 a day, that's 6,000 plants. That's 6,000 of these over a six hour period or seven hour period. That's intense. You were working on details back then, oh, evaluating yeah. all the tools. <laughs> you that's where Brian Boggs came yeah. from. Now, is Thomas Lee Nielsen coming out with us? <laughs> I don't think their clientele are really big into cutting tobacco. <laughs> Director sets were also big when Brian was a kid. Now he is using what looks to be an industrial strength director set to cut corners and much, much more. I can just set that up in here and cut it without building a jig for it. So I just, this is what I call my universal mortising jig. Let's see, this is going to have to go this way. So I'll have to turn this around and turn this around and set this up so that it moves this way. It supports a lot of creative work in engineering. 
But even though the aluminum extrusion is, you know, about 80 cents a linear inch now, in the long run, it's a much less expensive, more efficient way to build a lot of jigs. That does. That does a beautiful job. And it's going to be within a thousandth or two of three of three eighths. Even good enough for my mother-in-law. That's right. Yes, very good. She'll get that caliper out, won't she? All right, she will. <laughs> so, Chuck, one of the first power tools I got, certainly the first stationary power tool I got, was a Delta 14-inch bandsaw. And I had it for years. I finally broke it and I finally wore it out because I kept sawing bigger and bigger and bigger stuff. And then I went and got a real saw. This is a, a Yates American 30-inch, what they call a snowflake. And I don't know of a better bandsaw anywhere. I've started to do is a lot of template sawing because we get into situations like this with a wood like um, cypress. If you run in with a router, one end of this or the other, no matter which way you cut it, you're cutting against the grain and it'll chip out here or it'll chip out here. The thing is people think of bandsawing as not being quite as precise as template routing. But template routing doesn't get you quite ready for, for a finish. You still have to sand. And the divots or the, the vibration that you find in, the, in even a really good uh, template router bit, it's going to take a little bit to sand. And it turns out these uh, bandsaw cuts, if you hold that up to the light, you can see them. They're just a, you know, maybe five thousandths deep at the most. That's not a lot of sanding. Oh, that's not bad at all. Now I'll show you how this yeah, is cut. Great. This radius is a half inch larger than the radius I'm actually cutting because I'm on the outside reaching in. So this overhang, you'll see when I'm done. Okay. And it's a half inch overhang, so this is inside that radius by a half inch. Beautiful. So now this leg that I cut last week should be not just close, but identical to this. That is outstanding. But the creative work doesn't stop there. His chair designs are captivating. The outdoor chairs that I've been making lately, even though they, rem they remind people of Adirondack. They're not structured like any chair I've ever seen. The joints are not like any chair I've ever seen. The guitar chair that I've been working on recently, I've never seen a structure like that before. So it's not building on a traditional form, but it does build on traditional joinery concepts and a very traditional, old-school, grounded sense of how wood works, how adhesives work. I want each form to be as comfortable as it can possibly be. I don't make conscious compromises there. Building chairs has always come naturally to Brian. Building an efficient business, however, well, he had some questions. When he relocated to Asheville from his shop in Berea, Kentucky, he surrounded himself with those who designed business models with as much detail as the furniture in Brian's gallery. The answer, the Boggs Collective. It was an opportunity to build a company from the ground up around core values. Those values include excellence, innovation, integrity, and social and environmental responsibility. The mission of the Boggs Collective is to produce exquisite furniture with a vision that supports furniture makers and forest sustainability. The plan is to keep employees to a minimum and work with independent craftsmen. This business model offers artists a place to work, learn, and provides access to the resources they need. Well, it may be a new take on business, but when it comes to creating the final product, Brian Boggs does it the old-fashioned way. He lets his imagination take over. It's a lot of fun being able to play like that. To just, you know, let ideas download in whatever form they are and go with that. 
and just keep listening to what the chair is trying to be and let it go instead of trying to make an Adirondack chair or trying to make a ladder back chair or trying to make a craftsman style chair. Just let, let's, let something happen that's trying to be. And I really think that's, that's where these designs come from. They're already there. They're just trying to find a place to be built. Coming up on the Highland Woodworker, how to make sure your masterpiece has the right shine every time. You're watching the Highland Woodworker. Rikon Power Tools, tools designed by woodworkers. your woodworking experience sign up for wood news online a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news tips and classes highland woodworking has to offer by signing up you'll receive the latest episode of the highland woodworker special store promotions and wood news online delivered straight to your inbox sign up today this portion of the highland woodworker is brought to you by Whiteside Machine Company, top quality, industrial grade, and American made. Rikon Power Tools, tools designed by woodworkers. And by Masterpiece Wood Finishes, helping you build beautiful furniture. One of the most gratifying parts of any project is applying the finish. With so many to choose from, which one is right for your project? We're discussing those considerations in The Big Finish. We're at the home of Masterpiece Wood Finish with Kurt Gerald. He's a coatings expert. How do you do, Kurt? Hey, Chuck. It's great to see you today. You know, Fleischner, Dresner, Jewett, some of these other guys have written some great how-to books on finishes. But today, I'd like to hear from you some of the criteria that you look at when you're selecting a finish for one of your projects. Well, I always want to know, what is the gloss level? Uh, some people don't like it real glossy. Some people like just kind of a warm luster. Some people want it flat. That's always real important. You know, I think even use is probably important to you, whether you're going to have children involved, whether there's food involved, whether there's a lot of wear, right? Oh, yes. And, and also, uh, where are you going to put it? Uh, is it going to be outside? Is it going to be inside? The shop environment, uh, if you're doing it, let's say out in the garage, and you've got the door up and it's the summertime, it might be a high humidity kind of situation and you can't control it. It might be that you've got bugs in the air. That's the problem too. Uh, you've got to be able to have the right finish for the right shop situation. You know, here we have all kinds of clean rooms for doing our high tech coatings, but in my own personal shop, I don't and I'm constantly having to fight dust and dust nibs with certain types of finishes and it's a real bother for me. Well, you know, with a, a finish like uh, an oil and wax finish, you really don't have the big worry about the dust. You can almost wipe it on and then wipe it off and wipe it down to clean. Well, also the consideration of equipment. I, like I said, I don't have in my shop, I don't have a clean room 
Um, then you have to have certain spray equipment, clean, dry air. Do you have those kind of things in your shop, Chuck? <laughs> At one time, I had lights that that were explosion proof, and I had a motor <laughs> that was explosion proof, and <laughs> and uh, I don't use any of that anymore. But if I was building a type of furniture that required, let's say, a lacquer finish, I would have to go out and build that kind of a, an environment again. Do you ever worry about disposal and waste and that sort of thing? Well, sure. You want to be in and have a good sense about the environment. And you don't want to have large containers of finish left over that end up being thrown in a landfill. Because all of this has to be disposed of someplace. So that's always a consideration. Right. Knowing that you have a school and that you teach a lot of finishing, do most of your students come in with a high skill set? They really understand how to apply every kind of finish? Well, everybody's at a different point on, on everything. And the more simple that you can make the finishing process with the better results, the better everything's going to be. Well, I think it's so important some things that you've shared are these considerations. They're very similar to the considerations we look at here in our coatings facility. Masterpiece Wood Finish was developed by woodworkers for woodworkers. And it might be that perfect finish for that masterpiece that you're working on. That's right, Chuck. And that's the heart of this product, is helping novices create that foolproof finish that they're looking for. Thank you so much for watching this show. And yes, we're doing that Twitter thing and Facebook. And until next time, I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland Woodworker. The Highland Woodworker is brought to you by Highland Woodworking. Find tools delivered to your door since 1978. And these fine sponsors. Forest Manufacturing, saw blades for smooth, quiet, precise cuts, guaranteed. Whiteside Machine Company, top quality, industrial grade, American made. Masterpiece Wood Finishes, helping you build beautiful furniture. Peach State Lumber Products, your source for high grade hardwoods. JDS, leaders in air filtration, dust collection, and woodworking machinery. Rikon Power Tools, tools designed by woodworkers. Gorilla Glue, for the toughest jobs on planet Earth and by Popular Woodworking Magazine.